I'm Dr. Sabrina Siegel with the Neuroscience Education Institute, and twice a month, I sit down with a renowned mental health care expert to discuss breakthroughs and best practices for treating patients with mental illness. As most of you know, May is Borderline Personality Disorder Awareness Month, and I have here with me an expert on borderline personality disorder, Dr. Robert Gregory. Dr. Robert Gregory is Professor of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Upstate Medical University, where he serves as Director of the Psychiatry High Risk Program, a treatment program for youth and young adults struggling with suicidal thoughts or behaviors. Welcome to the show. Hi. Dr. Gregory, what are the hallmark features of borderline personality disorder? The diagnostic criteria can be a bit confusing because there are nine different diagnostic criteria and they all seem very different. And the most helpful way to think of them is that this is a disorder of instability. So there's instability of self-image and thought and with associated symptoms of identity disturbance, dissociation, under stress and emptiness. There's instability of mood, and so the mood can switch moment by moment or one or two days at a time or hours. You have anger, outbursts, uh, inappropriate anger, uh, instability of behaviors such as recurrent self-harm and suicide, or impulsive pleasure-seeking behaviors, which can look like bipolar disorder too, because excessive spending is very common, uh, substance use, binge eating, risky sexual encounters, and instability of relationships. So you can have fears of abandonment and frantic efforts to avoid that, paranoia and suspiciousness under stress, and this pattern of idealization, devaluation, which we can talk some more about, where there may be an initial period where the patient believes that they've just found Mr. or Mrs. Wright, you know, this um, wonderful person, the first, the first person I've met who's so kind and so understanding, really knows me. And there's a honeymoon period, and then something happens to disappoint them. Then they become totally devalued. One more person who's betrayed me, one more person who's abandoned me. What causes borderline personality disorder? Well, there are many theories to that, uh, but the exact etiology really is unknown at this point. There is a lot we do know, though, and um, we know that developmental issues do play a big role. Trauma and neglect have a higher correlation with borderline personality disorder than any other disorder other than PTSD, and early attachment may play a role as well. So this has been shown both in retrospective as well as prospective studies. There are psychological issues, profound sense of shame and badness. There's a phenomenon of the splitting that most of you may have heard about that can be what I talked about in terms of idealization or devaluation or it can be blaming others or blaming oneself and alternating that. And then then there are neurobiological etiologies as well. We know that genetics plays a role, and that's been shown in three different twin studies. And um, most exciting and most uh, perhaps most importantly, there's an emerging and actually a very strong and consistent body of evidence showing difficulties in the central nervous system in the emotion processing system. So there isn't a limited IQ or executive functioning. It's actually in how emotions and experiences are processed. So areas of the brain, you know, such as the insula, anterior cingulate gyrus, medial prefrontal cortex, posterior association areas, hippocampus, amygdala, ventral stratum, all those areas are involved in the processing of our experiences and emotions. And what happens is when there's an emotional stimulus, and they can see this on fMRI, the cortical areas don't light up, are relatively underactivated compared to healthy controls, whereas the subcortical areas, especially the amygdala and ventral stratum, become hyperactivated. And these have important consequences. The areas that become deactivated limit the uh, patient's ability to talk about recent experiences, uh, have a logical flow and sequence of he said, she said kind of interactions. They have enormous difficulty labeling specific emotions like shame, anger, sadness. Instead, they have this overgeneral memories and uh, this state of hyperarousal. 
they have an, uh, a poor integration of their schema, as we just talked about with the splitting. And I talked about the splitting of responsibility, where it's all one person's fault or another person's fault or their own fault of value with idealization and evaluation, or even motivation of either strong dependency needs or then just the opposite, the pushing away and wanting to be autonomous. And also the medial prefrontal cortex is very involved in our ability to gain perspective, to see situations more realistically, to be able to remember that we went through this before and to be able to self-soothe, to be able to understand others' perspectives, which is also called mentalization. So those are the consequences for the cortical hypoactivation. The hyperactivation of a subcortical areas also has consequences. So because when we're not able to label our emotions, the amygdala actually lights up. And there have been some really elegant neuroscience studies showing this. And so these patients are constantly anxious, constantly aroused, and looking for ways to self-soothe. And the way they look for ways to self-soothe is through impulsivity, through the ventral striatum. And so when they pursue these pleasurable activities, like going on a shopping spree, they're likely to do it when they're feeling dysphoric and anxious. And when they get this pleasure, it actually dampens down amygdala activity and they feel less anxious. That seems pretty bizarre, but some of us may be able to relate to that, like uh, at a happy hour to take a drink or when we feel stress, maybe start grazing. And uh, I find myself doing that. And you know, kind of eating and without even realizing it because I'm stressed. And so what we're doing there is a borderline solution to stress. It's a subcortical solution to stress. And we don't use that exclusively, but the patients with borderline personality disorder do. That's all they know how to do to self-soothe. That's so fascinating. What is the biggest challenge in terms of the management of borderline personality disorder that physicians or clinicians face? Well, there are many challenges, but I think the biggest one, what I see over and over again, is problems with recognition. And the research studies show this as well. About two-thirds of patients with borderline personality disorder either go underdiagnosed or misdiagnosed, even by really great experienced clinicians. So these are great clinicians, but they're not necessarily showing us the symptoms that they have. And we get overconfident in our ability to make that diagnosis. We feel like we can intuitively know when someone has borderline personality disorder and when they're not by how they're interacting with us or by how we feel in interaction with them. And that just isn't reliable because some patients we really will like a lot who have borderline personality disorder. And because clinicians, as clinicians, there's so much stigma, the patients don't have the stigma, interestingly, but clinicians do. Clinicians see this as a very high stigmatized disorder. And so they're very reluctant to make the diagnosis in someone who seems very reasonable and who they really like. And so they miss it. And that has really dire consequences. That leads me to my next question. What are some ways in which borderline personality disorder can actually be misdiagnosed? Well, that's a great question. It's certainly easy to diagnose, not only because of our overrecognition, but also because they may present more with anxiety and depression, which are almost 100% comorbid with borderline personality disorder, or they may have an eating disorder, they may have post-traumatic stress disorder, they may present with a substance use disorder to a rehab facility. And unless we're looking specifically for the borderline personality disorder, we may miss that. They don't say, I'm coming in because my borderline personality disorder is exacerbated. They're coming in because I'm depressed and suicidal. So that's one aspect. The other reason that this disorder may be misdiagnosed is that of the overlap of symptoms between borderline personality disorder and bipolar disorder. It's actually a very, it can be very, very difficult to make that diagnosis in the presence of bipolar disorder because of that overlap. And sometimes the two disorders can even co-occur, but it has dire consequences because bipolar disorder is treated primarily through mood stabilizers. And psychotherapy has a role, but it's a limited role. It's more educational and supportive. Whereas in borderline personality disorder, medications have a more limited role. Mood stabilizers and antipsychotics can help, but to a limited extent. 
However, there are evidence-based psychotherapies which have very large treatment effects, and I've seen tragic consequences with patients who have gone decades with borderline personality disorder undiagnosed or misdiagnosed as bipolar disorder, and the patients just aren't getting better, they're on disability, chronically symptomatic, and then once the diagnosis is made and they're referred to the appropriate treatment, they can have a marked response within a relatively short amount of time. What are the most effective treatments for borderline personality disorder? Well, as I hinted at, there are evidence-based psychotherapies, and by far the most common and the best researched is dialectical behavior therapy. And this treatment has been very successfully disseminated in almost every community in the U.S. and actually throughout the world, so that it's In most communities, it's not that difficult to have access to dialectical behavior therapy. It's controversial whether just the group alone is going to be helpful. Many studies suggest you really need the comprehensive dialectical behavior therapy, which includes weekly individual and weekly group. So it's a very intensive psychotherapy, but very effective. And in one study I did, two thirds of patients who completed a year of DBT had a clinical response. So it's a very effective treatment. It may not be the most effective treatment. There are some others which may possibly even be more effective, but it is highly effective and is the most easily accessed. Some of the others include mentalization-based treatment, a treatment that was developed in the UK but is available in Boston to a limited extent, uh, transference-focused psychotherapy, which is developed actually in the US but is available both in Europe and New York, uh, Philadelphia area mainly, and dynamic deconstructive psychotherapy, which was developed in Syracuse, New York, and is the most recent of the evidence-based treatments. And there's an emerging and actually very strong body of evidence emerging that this is actually a highly effective treatment. There's a randomized controlled trial uh, of co-occurring alcohol use disorders and borderline personality disorder where it was shown to be more effective than a high-intensity community care comparison. There is an effectiveness study comparing it to dialectical behavior therapy, and it actually had superior outcomes to dialectical behavior therapy in that study. And more recently, there's a randomized controlled trial in Iran uh, that had very positive findings, and those results are currently in press. I also want to add, you know, when these treatments are not available, it's harder to treat because usual counseling approaches and even standard CBT are relatively ineffective. There are medications that can be helpful, especially antipsychotic medications and low doses and mood stabilizers. So those have been shown to help in placebo-controlled trials, but they have small treatment effects. What patients often describe is they have a bit of a buffer. They don't react quite as strongly to things, but it's not going to have a major impact on the course of the disorder, unfortunately. Why is pharmacological treatment alone not very effective? Partly, it's not only that it's it's not effective for the borderline personality disorder, but borderline personality disorder is one of the strongest predictors of non-response to other disorders too. So other disorders that commonly co-occur with borderline personality disorder include things like major depressive disorder, panic disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, substance use disorders, eating disorders. So those commonly co-occur, but the usual treatments for those, such as starting an antidepressant or referring them to usual counseling or CBT, tend to be relatively ineffective. Doesn't mean you shouldn't try them. Definitely try to treat the co-occurring disorders. You just have a lower expectation that they'll work, or they sometimes work for two months and then stop working very quickly. And most importantly, and this is an important take-home message here, that benzodiazepines can actually worsen the course of borderline personality disorder. And the reason that's so important is that the majority of patients with this disorder really, really like benzodiazepines, you know, medications like Xanax, Clonopin, Ativan, Valium. They very often will say, this is the only class of medications that helps me. <laughs> so why, why am I saying to avoid them? So 
Remember what I said, these patients are in a state of hyperarousal, so extremely anxious, and they're looking for something to help them with their anxiety. And this class of medications does in fact help with the anxiety. So they feel less anxious and so they really like it. And that's often their most distressing symptom is the anxiety. However, on every other measure, they actually get worse. And one way to think about that is that benzodiazepines actually work on the same receptors as alcohol in the GABA system. So it's like they're walking around with a little bit of alcohol. And as I said, these are people who already don't have good frontal lobe functioning and disinhibition. And so you make them even more disinhibited and you end up exacerbating their mood lability, their anger outbursts, their pulse, impulsive behaviors, and most importantly, um, their self-harm and suicide risk. And you can see that clinically. And very often, the simple act of getting them off the benzodiazepines, you can see marked clinical improvement in just that one thing. What are some of the other challenges in terms of the management of borderline personality disorder? Well, you know, as I said, there are many challenges. There are also many rewards. So I, I don't want to give too negative a picture because if your patients can get into the right kind of treatment, evidence-based treatment and off benzodiazepines, pains, um, these are some of the most rewarding patients because they can have really life transformative experiences, you know, have the first meaningful friendship in their life, being able to work full time for the first time in their life being free of depression, suicidality in the first, for the first time of their life. But it can be difficult really to maintain a good working relationship with these patients, partly due to the splitting. So one minute we may be idealized and the best doctor this person's ever had. And the next moment, you know, just the most terrible doctor who is totally uncaring, really not understanding what they're going through. And uh, they may have uneven adherence. There may be complication of substance use disorders and drug seeking. There is a risk of suicide, and can talk about that some more. Um, but they they um, they also uh, a, a very unique and interesting thing about borderline personality disorder is that they really push our buttons in very strong ways, either positively or negatively, depending on whether we're being idealized or devalued. And that makes it difficult for us to be objective. And sometimes we intervene in unproductive ways, you know, wanting to take over from the therapist, for instance, or over-medicate them or under-medicate. And um, so it's, it's very hard sometimes to keep our own therapeutic mindset uh, with this patient population. What are some useful management strategies for psychiatrists and primary care physicians that you'd like to share with us? Well, that's a great question. And I do have some that I suggest. And our listeners may find the acronym SCARED helpful, or maybe it'll be terrifying to use that acronym, but um, that's S-C-A-R-E-D. So the S stands for suicide prevention. And I'd be happy to talk more about that, but this is a population actually that has significant suicide risk and paying attention to that, taking it seriously is really important. The C is caring and commitment. So the caring is something that this patient population really needs. They they have this strong dependency, wishes to be taken care of. They need to know that the doctor does care about them. And in terms of commitment, what I mean by that, because of their dependency, it can be sometimes hard for the patient to take ownership or commitment for their own treatment and recovery. And instead, they may go along with everything and then rebel against it and be non adherent or get themselves into other kinds of trouble. So as much as possible, really trying to develop a sense of ownership and decision-making in the patient, be as collaborative as possible in the decisions that are made. The A is avoid benzodiazepines, as we talked about. The R is refer to evidence-based therapies, as we talked about. The E is educate. So education about the causes of anxiety, So instead of saying, yes, you have generalized anxiety disorder, and let's try all this slew of medications to help with that, to say instead your anxiety is actually a consequence of problems in your emotion processing system in your brain that's causing a certain part of your brain to become hyperactive. And so what you need to do is to practice processing your emotions in a different way with your therapist and learning 
the underlying emotions that you may not even be aware of that are driving your anxiety. And similarly, you can educate them about their drinking or cannabis use. Those are the two most common drugs that are used by this patient population. And alcohol, because of its disinhibiting effect and also its prolonged withdrawal, greatly exacerbates um, the course of borderline personality disorder. And surprisingly, cannabis does as well, not because it's disinhibiting, but it shuts down the emotion processing system. And so many patients will turn to it for relaxation and numbness so they don't need to feel their emotions. But of course, the therapy is trying to do the opposite to help them process their emotions. And I think because it does shut down those systems, what the research is showing is that long-term cannabis use leads to increased anxiety, increased depression, and increased suicidality and suicide risk. So those are things you can educate your patients about. And finally, the D is to diagnose. So as we talked about, diagnose, diagnose, diagnose. Easier said than done. I think it is hard for the reasons I talked about. And what I really recommend, another great take-home point, is use one of the many self-rated scales. Just incorporate it into your practice. They're very quick to complete. There's a nine-item scale, the um, uh, Upstate Borderline Questionnaire. There's uh, one developed by McLean, which I think is 10 items. There's even four-item scales, which are pretty good. And that way you'll, you know, if they score, above the cutoff on the scales, and you can ask them some more questions to clinch the diagnosis. Uh, another good question to ask is about the mood lability. Of all the symptoms of borderline personality disorder, the mood lability is the one that's the most sensitive and specific for this disorder. So does your mood fluctuate a lot day to day? If they answer yes to that, then your suspicion for the diagnosis goes way up. What can you say about suicidality in patients with borderline personality disorder? Suicide risk is a really underappreciated aspect of borderline personality disorder. This is a disorder that has a 6 to 10% completed suicide rate, making it one of our most lethal disorders. And these are in longitudinal studies going up to 30 years out. I think for various and complex reasons, we tend to not take suicidality very seriously in our patients with co-occurring borderline personality disorder. And I still cringe when I hear colleagues talk about, you know, oh, this suicide attempt occurred in someone with borderline personality disorder, you can discharge them because it has to be then, it's more attention seeking, you don't have to worry about it. Nothing can be farther from the truth. So, you know, when you think of manipulation and tension seeking and associate with this disorder, you're going to have some, um, some dead patients on your hands because, as I said, the rates of completed suicide are very high. I think what often happens, though, is that when they are taken seriously and you have someone depressed and suicidal in the emergency room, then you admit them to the unit, they can so quickly reconstitute and they appear then like they're laughing and happy on the inpatient unit. And the clinician says, you know, gosh, I thought this was a really severe depression and serious suicide risk, but this person must have just wanted, you know, attention and be manipulating me. So because of the mood lability, the clinician often feels duped and then doesn't take as seriously the next time it comes around. So the most important caveat is really to take it seriously and to admit them, not for long term, they usually do rapidly reconstitute on inpatient units. And I generally don't recommend keeping them on inpatient units more than a week because they start to regress after a week and can actually get worse rather than better. But really, if, if they're presenting with the usual risk factors, definitely go ahead and hospitalize them and um, keep them safe until they can reconstitute. Could you tell us a little bit more about dynamic deconstructive psychotherapy or DDP? I know you touched on it a little bit earlier, but could you share a little more with us about that? Sure. It's an exciting treatment. It's the newest of the evidence-based treatments with a growing number of studies, and it really tries to address and correct what we know about the neurobiological and psychosocial deficits of borderline personality disorder. I look at effective psychotherapy for borderline personality disorder very similar to effective treatment for stroke. Because in borderline personality disorder, I mentioned there is impairment of the motion processing system and mentioned some of the areas. 
And it's not only that these areas are hypoactivated, there's actually atrophy, up to 25% atrophy of these brain areas. So this is an area of the brain that's really not functioning well. And just like with the treatment of stroke, you know, after the first few hours, medications are relatively ineffective for stroke. That doesn't mean you can't treat them, though. What is effective, as we know as physicians, what is effective is physical and occupational therapy. And the reason these are effective is that neurons that fire together wire together. And so you have the person practice what their deficits are. And what happens is it strengthens existing motor neuron pathways. You actually build new synapses. And you may even, and this is relatively new information, but you may even be able to build new neurons in certain parts of the brain. And so you can sometimes even have a complete recovery. Now you have borderline personality disorder with less tissue damage than stroke, but the same principles apply. And instead of building the motor neuron pathways, you're building the affective pathways, the emotion processing pathways, and strengthening those through practice. So in dynamic deconstructive psychotherapy, they really practice talking about recent interpersonal episodes, putting them into a sequence, which we call autobiographical memory. So they practice that hippocampal function. They practice labeling their emotions because we know that labeling emotions, that ability is strongly linked to the amygdala uh, activation and, and, and stability. So if they can label their emotions, they're less likely to become anxious. And the borderline patient will not be able to identify their emotions most typically. Instead, they'll just say, I'm upset, I'm anxious. They won't be able to identify the underlying emotion that is causing the anxiety. And then it works on integrating the schema. I talked about how the splitting and that the schema are very poorly integrated with the responsibility and dependency autonomy and idealization devaluation. So be able to hold both sides together at the same time is something that they can get better at. And finally, uh, figuring out how to be able to reflect on their experiences, how to build relationships where they can be authentic and actually uh, share some of that and not cope through avoidance, but cope through processing what's happening in their experiences. These are all things that dynamic deconstructive psychotherapy works on, and it maps very nicely to what we know about the uh, neurophysiology underlying borderline personality disorder. That sounds so exciting. Thank you so much for sharing such great information with us. It has been wonderful having you on the show. Thank you, Dr. Gregory. My pleasure, thank you. And thank you all for listening. Join us next time on the NEI podcast. This podcast was brought to you by the 15th Annual NEI Congress, a psychopharmacology conference that allows clinicians to improve their patient outcomes and earn CME credits. Early bird rates end June 28th. Reserve your spot before it sells out. For additional information, see the link in the podcast description.